Yeah. Unfortunately, I, I forgot to tape the previous hour, so I just need to recapture a little bit of what we talked about. Uh, the main points so far in chapter eight is that we kind of ended up with an argument for something which at least should be a part of the supply curve, this final expression here. And to achieve that, we used the concept of a cost function. Okay, we need to construct to construct the profits, we need some revenues and some costs. So we kind of uh, in the previous chapter, in chapter 7, we kind of argued for the exi existence of this one. And then we, in this chapter, argue for, or maybe not even argue, but at least define that uh, sensible producers should maximize profits. And uh, given that, and then, no, we explicitly use the assumption of a perfectly competitive market by substituting this varying P with a constant P. And then by taking derivatives to maximize profits, we end up with a solution structure here where price e equals marginal cost as a function of Q. So um, this is a link or a functional description between price and quantity on the producer hand. And that is basically what we're aiming for when it comes to finding a supply curve. Now you should recall that when we discuss this concept of a supply curve, we kind of agree that it should be increasing, okay? There's, there's no kind of not no sense in a supply curve going down. It has to go up, okay? It, um, that, that's kind of obvious, isn't it? If you produce more, then the price must rise to kind of cover the costs, unless it will be silly. So the shape of this marginal cost curve is to some extent important here. So let's uh, move on here and look at what's often referred to as the short run supply curve here. <coughs> Basically, it says up here we have found the supply curve now through P equals MQ or Q or price equals marginal cost. However, the question of how much of the marginal cost curve that should be used remains. Okay, And of course, this question more or less uh, implicitly states that we shouldn't use all of it. Now let's look at the profit again. Okay, the profit uh, is still P times Q minus COQ in a perfectly competitive market. The price is given and we multiply by quantity to find the revenue and then we subtract the cost. Now if you look at uh, in which region these profits are positive by looking at the inequality pi OQ less than zero, then of course we can solve that inequality by just substituting the expression for pi as we do here and keeping this inequality sign and then we can do a little algebra here or just simply dividing through this inequality by this q variable. Of course we assume that q is positive, we cannot produce negative amounts here, so q will be a positive number, then we don't need to bother about inequality sign, so it's kept. So if we divide this one with Q, then this one is vanishing, and of course, then we get C O Q divided by Q, which we can be put on the right-hand side of the inequality. So this inequality tells us when profits are negative, doesn't it? We assume we start by P O Q less than, I less than zero, and then we end up with this one. So if P is less than C O Q divided by Q, and we have put a name to this fraction or construct, haven't we? We call this the average total cost. So if we take the total cost and divide it by the unit or pr produced, uh, the, the number of produced units, then we get the average total cost. So it turns out that if price is less than the average total cost, then profits are negative. Okay. And assuming that uh, these uh, ma profit maximizing guys still are greedy, of course they don't want to have a negative profit. Okay, so we should not expect to pick parts of the marginal cost curve where profits are negative. Now let's look at uh, a structure. Let, let, let me first make a very simple argument why a marginal cost curve would look like this. Okay, so we kind of have that inside. Now if we return 
to this one, if you look at the shape of, uh, of the, the profit curve here, you see it as it kind of goes up and down and so. And if you look at the revenue curve here, and if you look at the cost curve here, uh, it shouldn't be too hard to accept that to kind of get these patterns, you need some kind of at least a third degree type of equation. To kind of get something that looks like this, you cannot do that by a second degree structure. Okay, so you need at least a third degree structure to, to get these kind of patterns as you kind of see here, at least on the on the cost structure. So then the marginal if if this is the cost function then, okay, then of course the marginal cost must be the derivative of a third degree kind of equation. And that would produce a second degree kind of equation, okay? The derivative of is of course three like that, okay? So this is the derivative if this is f. So there is good reasons to assume that the marginal cost cur curve at least must, or at least could look something like this. This is a typical second degree kind of behavior, isn't it? Either it could go like this or it could go like this, okay? <coughs> now we argued here previously that obviously Above this point here, this is the average cost, and we argue that below the average cost here, that means under here, it may be questionable whether we should use the, the marginal cost curve as representative of the supply curve. You see, we could alternatively argue like this. Okay, we know that the supply curve should be increasing. So definitely it must be after this point. This part of the marginal cost curve is not interesting. It could not be a supply curve. Okay? The supply curve must increase. So the question is, should we start from here, from here, or from here? Okay, that's the po point. We argued previously that if you look at total cost, then we should start from here, okay? To kind of shut down if the total cost is negative or the profit is negative. Then you should start from here. What the textbook say is that in some cases, it could be possible to cover the fixed cost. And then you kind of move from the average total cost down to the average variable cost, which is this one. So they say that, okay, not necessarily this point, but perhaps this point. We cover parts of the fixed cost and the long run option of adjusting capital level is not utilized, okay? So now we look at this in the short run. Of course, in the long run, you have an option of kind of tuning these capital and labor mix in, in a better position. So you probably, and at least as assumably, you can kind of cover the fixed costs. So the assumption is that instead of picking th the marginal cost curve from this point or from this point, we, fi we pick it at the midpoint here, where the average variable costs uh, remain positive. So you see in this point, of course, the average variable cost is at the minimum and it's bigger on each side here. So the conclusion to this is that we use a certain part of the marginal cost curve to represent the supply curve. We use the part above the minimum of the average variable cost. So it's kind of this hatched part here, which represents the real supply curve related to this example. So if you're asked to find the supply curve based on the mathematical structure as we have discussed, then of course you have to find the marginal cost curve, and then you have to pick the part of it which is the the minimum of the average variable cost. That's kind of what it practically means. And the argument is related to the fact that there is certain options that we do not utilize fully here related to a long-term position. Of course, in the short run, we kind of don't adjust this labor and capital kind of thing. So there is options to kind of do things slightly better than this. So in that sense, uh, our definition of a supply curve is a certain part of the marginal cost curve above average variable cost. The Cessier hand supply curve is marginal cost when P is larger than average variable cost. Okay. Of course, the argument related to how to construct the market supply curve works exactly in the same way as it did on the demand side. Then we said, okay, there are certain customers, customer 
a demands 10 customer b demands 20 and so on. of course we have to add these numbers together for each price points to find the total demand the same thing happens here if producer a produces one barrel of oil producer b produces three barrels of oil and they they are the market of course they together will produce four one plus three so you have to add together all these supplied quantities for any kind of price combination and here you kind of see an example on what it may look like if there are three suppliers so the supplier the first supplier here has a the correct part of the marginal cost curve for the first supplier is this one and then it's this one and then it's this one and of course if you add this point plus this point plus this point you get that point then you add this point and this point and this point to get that point and so on okay so you finally get this market supply curve if you like to call it that and of course each of these marginal cost curves don't have to be replicas of each other they could be slightly different in shape but they should all be increasing as they have already done but you, you can see the difference here now in this case on the production side we, we more or less had to utilize this underlying infinity or price taking behavior directly in the mathematical argument we, we kind of didn't need to do that when we did this uh, on the demand side even though we discussed it and said that if there is options for consumers to collaborate here and of course this argument won't hold so we moved from a short run individual producer supply curve into a short run market supply curve okay you probably recall that we introduced a concept called consumer surplus when we discussed in chapter 3 and 4 and the consumer surplus was based on the fact that if there is a given price in the market well suppose we have both the supply and the demand curve here now. so now we are in a kind of competitive market and we argue that of course the equilibrium price would be here won't it an intersection between supply and demand and we argue that on the consumer hand there are certain consumers up here who are willing to pay this amount that price but just don't have to pay that price they earn a certain profit here and we construct that profit by adding all these consumers together to to construct this area which we refer to as consumer surplus Now we have argued, haven't we, that uh, this is not a good figure in a sense because, okay, here they kind of run the total marginal cost curve, okay? And we have argued that it's just a part of this, actually this part, which is the supply curve. So I think it's better to do it in this kind of diagram. The, the point is obvious, isn't it? The supply curve is the same as the marginal cost. The marginal cost tells you how much it costs to produce one unit, one extra unit. And of course, the price tells you how much you get. <coughs> so at any point on this marginal cost curve, for instance, at this point, this is the cost of producing this unit. This is the price, the whole thing. Of course, then you get a profit here by this area. So if you add all these potential production possibilities together, of course, this whole area would constitute the producer surplus same here the supply curve is a part of the marginal cost curve meaning that for instance at this point for a given market price this point this is the marginal cost this is the marginal price of course this will give a profit add addition for the pr producer so in this case this part will be named producer surplus So you see on top of this triangle, you, you see the consumer surplus under the producer surplus. Kind of obvious. If you actually draw the marginal cost curve, you of course you get a kind of a, a bigger part of the image. We kind of cut it here in this, or actually we cut it exactly here. 
in this figure and we also add a demand curve <coughs> but the, the argument the logic is of course exactly the same okay is this clear there's a lot of different stuff here okay we talk about costs we talk about marginal costs and marginal revenues and revenues so there, there's a lot of kind of maybe if you haven't been into this theory before it's a kind of floating around i would expect that you kind of need to spend some time familiarizing with these concepts and always try to think what they really mean okay it's not that difficult okay if i buy some kind of product in a market and the, m the price is 10 okay yes so each time i buy this product i pay 10. if the marginal cost for the producer of that product exists is six for each time i buy one of these products i pay 10 it costs six for the producer of course then he will earn four okay that is be his net profit that's kind of what we get by looking at a certain line here so to speak <coughs> So what happens in the long run? Now what it says here is that the previous arguments are in principle repeated, adding more than labor as possible decisive input. Now recall that we started out here in a sense with a situation where our costs were linked to the primary inputs, labor and capital. Then we kind of change that into Q. Now we can go back again. Of course then we can construct our profit as R minus this way of looking at the cost and this is an important point because this means that even if a company earns zero even if this pi is zero it means that in that case this capital cost is covered okay if this pi equals zero then this part must be covered and what does that part mean really the the textbook is a bit brief here, so I, I'll try to explain a little bit more comprehensively. This R is what we refer to as the cost of capital, isn't it? So it means what it costs us to borrow money. Now, if we choose to borrow money to put into our company as a producer, then given that we are greedy and rational businessmen that means that any other investment opportunity we see is worse than this one do you agree if i'm sensible i have i can put my money into my own business i can put it into another guy's business if i choose to put it into my own business and i'm greedy and rational it means that my local investment opportunity is the best one And there's a reason for this argument. Uh, of course, that's what's tried to, to be said here. This means that even if a company earns zero profit, it covers its opportunity cost of capital R, meaning that it does not have any better alternative investment opportunities. The reason why we're interested in making this argument is kind of to argue, at least try to argue, why a perfectly competitive equilibrium actually may exist in the real world. That's the reason. Because it turns out that the profit you will earn in a perfectly competitive market is zero. That's kind of obvious, isn't it? If price equals marginal cost, it means that we cannot get a higher price than what it costs us to produce it on the margin. We don't even cover that. So it will either be negative or zero, this one. But underlying this argument, is that there is a certain capital cost here and that capital cost must be our best investment opportunity and as long as we get that covered then it's no better to take that money out and invest it elsewhere okay so in that sense we may kind of ac accept uh, either a zero or maybe even a negative profit especially of course if this one is very big inside and not as big outside and it would actually be fortunate to for us to, to accept uh, a negative profit. <coughs> so
So it says in the end here, the classical entry exit driving zero profit argument follows. So let's look at that, okay? I think perhaps it's easier to... Yeah. Okay, the idea is this. Okay, we have an infinite number of possible producers, infinite number of consumers. Okay. Now let's look at the market. There is a market up there. It has an infinite number of producers in it, but there is a profit in it. So the producers which are in there now, they earn profits. So the difference between revenues and costs are positive. But there is an amount of, still an infinite amount of, of pr possible producers outside the market. And there are no entry and exit costs by definition. And if these outside potential producers are greedy, then they would like to go into this market, wouldn't they, to get a part of the profits. You agree? That seems logical. And of course, as you push more producers into the market, then profits will go down. Okay. As new producers come in, they will increase competition. And of course, the consequence must, must be that prices go down and hence also profits go down. The other option, if there is again a given market, an infinite amount of producers in it, which earns no profit, then of course, some of these will get out of the market, won't they? Because they don't earn anything. And in that case, the profit is so negative that it doesn't even cost cover their, their capital cost bar. So in both cases, you kind of end up with a situation where either new producers flow into the market, pushing profits down, or old producers get out of the market, taking profits up. But it is always stop at the zero profit then, won't it? That's kind of the, the conclusion. So we might say, maybe we should look at what it says here. When a firm earns zero economic profit, it has no incentive to exit the industry. Likewise, other firms have no special incentive to enter. Okay. A long run competitive equilibrium occurs when three conditions hold. All firms in the industry are maximizing profit. No firm has an incentive either to enter or exit the industry because all firms are earning zero economic profit. The price of the product is such that the quantity supplied by the, by the industry is equal to the quantity demanded by the customers. That's kind of what it will end with. Then th the dynamic process that leads to a long run equilibrium may seem puzzling. Firms enter the market because they hope to earn a profit and likewise they exit because of economic losses. Of course, in that case, they would in long run equilibrium, however, firms can earn zero economic profit. That's the point here. Why does a firm enter a market knowing that it will eventually earn er zero profit? The answer is that zero economic profit represents a competitive return for the first firm's investment of financial capital. That's what I tried to tell you over here, wasn't it? I tried to argue that as long as this one is covered and it is already put into it, must mean that it, this is the best opportunity of capital you have. So even if this one is zero, this one is covered. With zero economic profit, the firm has no incentive to go elsewhere because it cannot do better financially by doing so. If the firm happens to enter a market sufficiently early to enjoy an economic profit in the short run, so much the better. Okay, that can of course happen. Similarly, if a firm exited an unprofitable market quickly, it can save its investors money. Thus, the concept of long-run equilibrium tells us the direction that the firm's behavior is likely to take. Okay? So you could say that this competitive equilibrium is some kind of an ideal situation in a sense. Okay? You will never be there, but there are obvious arguments that you should end there, given that everything else is kind of kept constant in a sense. But from a practical point of view, it kind of tells us a boundary for economic activity. Either you can be in that situation, or close to that situation, or far from that situation. And for obvious reasons, we are interested in trying to achieve this competitive equilibrium because it, it, it has some interesting properties, which we will discuss in much more detail in the next chapter. Okay? We'll try to argue a little bit why why it's important to kind of reach this type of equilibrium. There are certain 
loss is involved here something we refer to as a dead weight loss which is kind of a measure of inefficiency in the market okay we'd like market to be as efficient as possible meaning that we would like to assign the right product to the right customer as as good as we can that's kind of what it's about so if you kind of miss that if the wrong customers buy the wrong products then it's it's kind of inefficient so that that's more or less what it's about okay that was the end of chapter eight actually the main point is simple okay we argued for the existence of a supply curve we made another argument that we can't use all of it okay if it's shaped like that we have to pick a certain part and then we argued in, in certain parts of this area at some point total profits becomes negative but we kind of shift that point a little bit down from that point due to the fact that there are certain things which we do not consider here which could make things a little better possibly covering up the fixed costs for us and then the next argument is related to the, the final part here is related to the fact that never forget that underlying is kind of the assumption over capital cost here and as long as we cover the capital cost we can kind of believe at least that even though there is kind of a financial zero profit in the market it will still cover up our capital costs and given that we choose to use our hard-earned money to invest in our own company and are able to cover that cost by the activity then we can't get any better return on investments in other markets so this is in a sense the end of a long story okay we started out in the first chapter by arguing why the equilibrium should be here okay we made some arguments on would be a shortage here leading to a force in that direction it would be an excess in this point leading to a force in that direction which kind of pinpointed us to the final solution but we kind of overstepped these underlying arguments which we have spent the rest of the course to on under what conditions should these two curves exist okay that's what we spent most of the time on making arguments sometimes mathematical models to argue why and when there is a demand curve and why and when and how it should look there is a supply curve so now we have kind of although not perfectly scientifically we have at least tried to argue why there is a supply curve why there is a demand curve how we could arrive at them which then of course can be used to find the intersection which produces the equilibrium and of course the next part of the story then starts going on okay what can we use these for we took an example related to events didn't we where we kind of said okay here is the here is the supply uh, the supply curve for football players or good authors here is the supply curve for for teachers or doctors or whatever and of course there is perhaps a bigger demand for teachers and doctors than for football players or authors but still the intersection between these supply curve and these demand curves still produces a higher salary than in the other case so we use these kind of model to argue why these entertainment guys and girls earn a lot of money okay so this is kind of what we can use these models for okay to look at different shapes different structures different shifts in these curves and try to derive some knowledge on how we would expect the market would react to various interventions from from for instance the government and the next chapter is related to these kind of situations so we will look at tolls and tariffs and taxes and all these kind of stuff that exists in the economy and so I try to analyze the effects of these interventions within these model frame the nice thing about it even though you may find it hard is that it's really relatively simple if we do this in another framework where we do not make the assumption of an infinite amount of each of them then it becomes extremely difficult so th the nice thing about this perfectly competitive equilibrium model is that it's relatively easy to analyze okay? it makes it much easier for us to say something about in what directions will things happen will the price stay constant will it be an increase or a decrease in price when they do various stuff 
So in Norway, for instance, there is um, mechanisms that give money to artists. Okay, there are certain artists who are assumed good enough; they they may get their salary from the state. I don't know what it's like in your countries. Maybe it's like that in Finland, Maya. Some of the authors they are assumed to be so good that they don't have to sell books to earn the money. Maybe they write weird books. Maybe there are painters who who paint weird pictures. Maybe they don't get value today, but maybe in hundred years they get very valuable. Of course, that's the problem, isn't it? The econom the economy itself don't take care of that. So you need then you need to for the government to subsidize, to put money into it, to arrive at a nice conclusion. For instance, li you like Picasso, no, nobody would buy his pictures when he painted, but of course today they are extremely valuable. Okay? So you need to take care of that. Of course, how to take care of that? That's not so easy. Of course, it's easy to give them payments. The question is how much payment should they get? Should they get much? Should they get little? You need to make those decisions. Okay? And then that you can use econo no economic theory to do. Not very good, but at least you can try to use it, okay? And that's what we will talk about next time, next week, okay? You are like me. You don't feel for asking any questions right now, I can see. But if there are any questions, please. Okay. Have a nice weekend. Molda is playing.